Welcome to the Locker Room. This is Southland's podcast for men, where we read demons, conversations, talk about the right things in the right ways. My name is Scott Affield. Thanks for checking out the podcast. This podcast is all about creating a culture of godly men that fight for the most important things. And just off the top, I want to give you a couple quick reminders of, of some things coming up at Southland. Our group's session just started uh, January 21st. There's a ton of different groups that are meeting at all five of our campuses. You should check them out. And you can go to our group's directory at southland.church slash groups. Uh, there's a bunch of groups there. I, I'll highlight a couple. Uh, I would encourage you to look for, jump into, or start a locker room group at your campus. It's a great opportunity to connect men. All you got to do is listen to podcasts, check out the show notes, uh, and have those discussions with some guys. It, it'd be a great opportunity. I'm also doing Fight Club at the Georgetown campus. Uh, we started uh, on January 22nd. Uh, so we've done one week, and it's not too late. If you if you attend the Georgetown campus, invite someone, jump in with us. Uh, That's close you, to your birthday, isn't it? Isn't it like a week before your birthday? Yeah. 20, 20 what, 8, something 28, like yeah. yeah. And, and we, we both have January birthdays. So yeah, at Georgetown Fight Club, make sure you all sing happy birthday to Scott Hatfield. There you go. Every, how about that? Already kind of leaning into who our guest is. I bet you can under, <laughs> hear that voice. Uh, and if, if you don't attend that campus and you're just looking to jump in with us, uh, we have guys from every campus that end up coming to Fight Club uh, regardless. It doesn't matter. A uh, bunch of campuses, one church. Go to the directory. You can sign up there. Bottom line is you need community. It's a game changer. And as I said last week, uh, we're looking for marriage mentors who are willing to come and come alongside of pre-married and newly married couples. Here's what we're looking for. We're looking for couples that have been married for 10 years. Uh, if you've been married eight, we'll take you. Uh, couples who are baptized believers uh, that love our church, that are anchored in truth, that's, that drive and support our vision. Couples who are willing to come alongside relationally to just share their wisdom, lessons that they've learned, mistakes that they've made, share your story. If you've been married only once and you've been married for 10 years, awesome. If you are remarried and your your marriage is set on Christ and you're trying to, to, to live for him as a couple, that's perfect. We'd love to have you. If you're interested in learning more, send me an email at shatfield at southland.church. We have interest meetings coming up at every campus where you can learn more about being a mentor. You can ask any questions. Those, uh, those, those dates are in the show notes for you to check out. We'll have them at every campus. My guest for today, you probably already caught his voice. He's the founder creator of our Locker Room Podcast. He's a good friend of mine. His name is Scott Nickel. How are you, brother man? What's up, man? I feel like I should receive royalties or something if I'm like the founder or something like that. There's been no checks. If I'm we not get, sure why. If, if I get paid for this, I'll let you know, but I, right. don't, I don't think I am. Uh, what's up, buddy? How are you? I'm good. It's trying good. to get warm. Yes. You, it's cold uh, outside. You were, we it's four this. degrees this morning, mm-hmm. and uh, you did your cold plunge this morning. I did. How I was shortened it? it. 90 seconds. <laughs> so I've decided when it's under... When it's under like 15 degrees yeah. instead of three minutes, I do 90 seconds. Okay. Because what I've been reading is if it's that cold, you don't need that much Doesn't time matter. in there. Doesn't matter. It's Yeah, it's brutal, man. My hands is the worst part, hands and feet. Oh, so, gosh. Yeah. What, uh, how many days have you done this now? Let's see. This will be the Couple third weeks. week, and I okay. do it four, so I'm not good at math, but uh, that's eight. So okay. I've done it 11 times. 11 times. Yeah, tomorrow will be, tomorrow be 12, <laughs> and then I'll have three days off. Then you have three days three off. Days those, off. Are, those glorious yeah, days, right. and they go three, fast, don't three they? Three wonderful days <laughs> full of hot showers. And <laughs> three minutes goes takes a long time, doesn't it? It, it does. It does. And every time I, there's a part of me, because I use my phone as my timer, Yeah. and the, every time <laughs> I, I think to myself, oh, no, something's gone wrong. It should have been over by now. Something's wrong with my phone. And I have to tell myself, no, it's just you want to be out, yeah. and it'll be the alarm will it'll go fun. off in it'll 30 seconds. But one day, something will malfunction, and I'll freeze to death. <laughs> find you find me in there with a bro with a phone that's Face down. battery's dead. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, dude. Thanks for jumping on with us. Yep. Uh, we, we are in the middle of this locker room series that we're just talking about the ethos of godly men, mm-hmm. culture, values, characteristics, actions of, of godly men. And I wanted you to come on for a couple of weeks. We're going to go back to back um, to tackle a number of different topics, and today... Before we get into that, you know, we just launched the Southlands uh, Parenting Podcast, and so I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. I know that we had yep. an announcement about it this past weekend at church, but talk a little bit about it. Yeah, you know, I, we've talked about this before. I have kind of an allergy to, like, parenting books and mm-hmm. resources because oftentimes people who claim to be parenting experts are the last people you really want to yeah. listen to when it comes to parenting because parenting is brutal, parenting's hard. Yeah. And so there's only been a few resources over the years that I've really, really liked and thought were really, really helpful. But I felt like we needed to create some sort of resource for our parents that acknowledged that reality, that we're not coming from a position of being experts and telling you, like, here's the 12 steps to having godly, obedient children. 
instead the the theory or idea behind the podcast is simple like you can't give what you don't have so we're trying to impress upon parents what must be impressed upon their kids and so it's just really important for us to understand that man our parenting is always going to operate out of the overflow of what god's doing in our hearts and our minds and oftentimes what we want to do is we want to skip that step and we just want to we want to fix our kids or address whatever's going on with them but really what we need to do is address our own hearts first. And so that's the idea behind the podcast, and it's been fun recording it so far. It's a great, that's a great premise. It's a great drive. There's no silver bullet other than we got to cling to Jesus. Yeah. And we got to trust him and we got to do the hard things, but we got to bring a lot of grace and truth into all of those matters. So, and, and we've done six episodes, I think. Something like that. And we've, re- we're releasing them kind of one week at a time. But any, any, any specific episodes or anything that you want to share about any of those? I, I, I know we did them a little bit. You know, we did them a couple months yeah, ago. Yeah, there's a but. there's a couple in there. One we did that was kind of unique was on how to how to pick a school to send your kids to, which yeah, I think is a pretty fun. pressing you yeah. know pressing issue for a lot of parents. And so that that um, one would be something just to pique some people's interest because I yeah. know a lot of people are wrestling with that. So yeah, not trying to beat up any yeah. version of school. We mm-hmm. we've got kids in all of them, but yeah, just trying to wrestle through what does that look like in the times that we find ourselves in. So. Yep. Yeah, it's. It, I think it's going to be really encouraging for our parents. I think it's going to be a great resource for us as our as a church, and I think it'll be a great resource that we'll want to share with other parents because it's the hardest job on the planet. Just, yeah, it I, just is. I've not come across anything more than all my life. I mean, I've seen deadliest catch, but I, I you know, you yeah. get off the boat after a little bit. So yeah, yeah. You don't leave this boat. So yeah. those anyway, fish, those fish don't talk. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So today we're in the second part of uh, this series, Ethos of Godly Men. And again, ethos is not a word that we use all the time, but it's a word that we we, we understand. Basically, the definition of the, of this is is the characteristic spirit of culture, era, community, driven by its beliefs, values, and actions. And so you we see ethos everywhere that we look. You see it in companies, or organizations. You see it on sport, sports teams. You see it in the military. Churches have their own unique ethos that drives them based on biblical understanding, the context where they, they're on mission and the people that they're trying to reach. Uh, you even see it in families. I mean, you spend a little time with someone's family, you kind of know how they tick, what's important to them, their beliefs, their their values, what's important, uh, what hills they die on, what hills they don't. And in this series, we're just trying to take a look at God's Word and pay real close attention to our leader, Jesus, because our hope is, is that we want to follow him and emulate him and become like him and be about the things that he wants to do in us and, and through us. And today I wanted to come, I want you to come to, to talk for a couple of weeks. Um, but this one in particular today is about a message that you did uh, two, two Sundays ago that focused in on how Jesus operated um, when he came to earth a couple thousand years ago. And you talked about how he lived, how he interacted with culture, and how his personal ethos, his values, and his mission were in conflict with the culture that he came to rescue and redeem. And this sermon was called How to Be Hated in Three Easy Steps, which is a great title, simple, by the way. Simple steps, not simple, easy. Not easy, not that's easy. right, that's simple right. steps. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, talk about why you wanted to preach on this topic, why the, why the title, and what was your hope for, yeah. for this in our church? Yeah, it's fun um, as a communicator and as a leader when you get these moments to— to just do a standalone message, you know, we don't we don't do that that often, yeah. and so when you do, oftentimes it's an opportunity to just address something that's been on your heart, been on your mind, yeah. that you just haven't found the right context for yet within yeah. within the planning that you've already done with series and things like that. And so I had a couple different things floating around in my mind and heart, but this past fall in particular, for whatever reason, I, I just kind of really started to wrestle with. Look, I don't think that the American church is prepared for the days, the weeks, the months, the years, the seasons to come. I really do think that we are going to move into a time that's going to be much more akin to what's been normal for Christians for the past 2,000 years across um, cultures and continents and countries, which is that of some level of persecution, some level of contempt, some level of not being popular, loved, liked. And so... Because we've been we've been in what seems and feels like a season of cultural favor for the last couple hundred years in our country, as that's shifting and changing, I'm right. noticing Christians are really confused in some instances, angry in other instances, frustrated, off balance, not really sure how or why this has become the case, and then not sure what to do with that. Yeah. And so my hope was that we could address that tension that people on differing levels feel 
and then and then in some ways take the pressure off to go look this is what our leader promised so yeah. if you were expecting something different it's you need here. to change your expectations um, and then at the same time, we talked about this a little bit the other day. I think at some point this message will serve to be the outline for a longer series that may yeah. be three, four, five weeks long, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned at the very beginning of this of your message that there are there are times when there are challenges that are, that are thrusted upon us that we didn't choose. Mm-hmm. And I mean, in essence, we kind of did choose because we chose Jesus. Mm-hmm. But but the bottom line is is we we may not have understood that. You know, I came mm-hmm. to Christ when I was seventeen. Sure. And, and you know you you don't know all that you that's coming with these decisions whether that's getting married or having kids I mean you just don't know and but you mentioned in that message that the big challenge for us in this new culture in America is how we navigate as Christ followers in a nation and a culture that's resistant to it yep. and you reminded us that what Jesus told the disciples and he's telling us today in John fifteen eighteen if the world hates you remember that it hated me first yep. and he's telling us to go out. And live for him. He's not saying go out and be mean or ugly or self-righteous. He's not saying be obnoxious. He's making reference to the collision course that we find ourselves in the middle of, of these conflicting ethoses, the world's ethos, and then the ethos that we find in God's Word that should drive us as men and us as Christ followers. And so take a minute just to talk about that challenge and, and where the current church of Jesus finds itself today. I know you kind of really mentioned some of that, but you know, it's, it's disoriented or, or big words. We see some that are, you know, mm-hmm. progressively moving to a place where they deconstruct their faith. There's people that are afraid mm-hmm. on and on. What, what are some of the things? Yeah, you- what's, what's interesting. And I think one of the reasons that people within the church have find them, found themselves off balance and kind of surprised is because Many within the church, and I think they're justified in feeling this way, are going, I haven't changed like yeah. I haven't changed what I've believed in the last 30, 40 years. Yeah. What's shifted is culture. Yes. So, you know, a great example of that is beliefs on on sexuality and marriage. Yeah. You know, so if you would have told, you know, any any person who was attending an Orthodox church that at some point in the future, you know, the Supreme Court of the United States would deem it legal for gay people to get married to one another and that would be considered the equivalent and the same as yeah. heterosexual couples getting married a lot of people would have struggled to even believe that that could be the case yeah. and so those who've held on to man this is just what tradition has held this is what culture has held and this is most importantly what the bible has held and yeah. what jesus has taught us for thousands and thousands of years, we haven't moved. The culture has, and because the culture has moved, we are now perceived as being the enemy in some yep. way, shape, or form. And so that's just one example of, of yep. many where I think people are just off balance going, man, I didn't ask to get put in the cultural crosshairs. Yep. All I did was remain where I was, but now I find myself in the cultural crosshairs. And so mm-hmm. there's been reactions like, what do I do? Do I stay quiet? Do I speak up? Do yep. I say what I believe? Do I hide? what I believe. You know, what should I do? Yeah. No, that's uh, that's excellent. You, 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 you ask a question, why would anyone hate Jesus? Mm-hmm. And you mentioned that Jesus left no room for neutrality. And you mm-hmm. you mentioned a couple of these, and I added a couple in here. But he yeah. you, you says, you're either for me or against yeah. you. That's yeah. Matthew 12, 30. The Bible talks about that there's no room for a lukewarm faith, Revelation 3, 16. Mm-hmm. That Jesus lowers the boom with a lot of clarity in John 14, 6. And you drove this point home. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's the most controversial verse in the Bible today, but it's the most loving thing if it's true. Yep. And if it's true, then it should really cause us to really stand up and consider and then and then adjust our lives to it. And so he wants us to know truth. He wants us to experience grace, and he wants us to have la- lasting hope. And, and I guess as you think about you know how these verses put Jesus in the line of fire those different passages in revelation and, and Matthew and then this one um, in in um, in John mm-hmm. um, it puts us in the line of fire as well and so talk about we may not have thought about that we may not have realized that but we are in the line of fire too and so talk for a second just about that yeah it, it gets perceived as as arrogance um, to how it's, it's how dare you claim yeah. to to know yeah. something so important and so profound? What we're claiming is, man, we're just relaying what our leader told us. And yeah. to your point, 
seems incredibly loving to not only say there is there is a place that you want to go. There's a place you want to be. It's going to be your ultimate yeah. home. It's a place where you'll belong. It's a place where there'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sadness. Right on down the list. And by the way, here's the way to get there. It's me. You yeah. know now that may be perceived as arrogant unless it's true. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so if it's true, then it's the most loving thing Jesus could possibly do. What would be unloving is for him to say, hey, there's this place. It's really awesome. There's going to be no more pain, no more sadness, no more, you know. And I just, you know, do your best to figure out how to get there. Hope you find me. Yeah, hope hope you can figure that out. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't want to presume upon you and tell you how to get there. Uh, that would be arrogant of me. So maybe you'll figure it out on your own. Maybe you won't, but I'll be I'll be waiting. That would be unloving and yes. cruel, you know. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus is neither of those things. But our culture has an allergy to a lot of things. It has an allergy to confidence. Sure. It has an allergy to truth. It has an allergy to exclusivity in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. It has an allergy to the very idea that I could be wrong in, about anything. Yeah. And so if I come to the table with some preconceived notions about God, about heaven, whatever that may be, religion, spirituality, and then I'm confronted with someone like Jesus who just drills down on this and yeah. goes, there's no room. You're either for me or against me. That is that is very faux pas in our culture. Yeah. So for any follower of Jesus to stand with Jesus in that puts us in the crosshairs as well. Now, that's why I think we're also seeing, though, a whole bunch of people who've been traditionally, you know, found themselves in Christian churches, yeah. um, followers of Jesus, have started to reexamine things and to look for ways out from under the very things that Jesus said, and yet somehow still claim to be Christians at the yeah. same time. We're seeing it with sexuality. We're seeing it with the exclusivity of the gospel right on down the list. Yeah. I mean, the, the things concerning us in our, in our church and the church is we see people say they follow Jesus, but they're unwilling to surrender their lives to the lordship of mm-hmm. Jesus. Yep. We we don't pursue a biblical worldview. We want to cut and paste. We want to take stuff out of the world because it's easier and we don't have to take shots if we can do so. And we just rather go to the buffet when Jesus doesn't have a buffet. Yeah, and it really reveals that what we're either doing is we're either cowering because we want to be people-pleasing and we don't like being unpopular. We don't like being perceived as uncool. We want to seat at the cool yep. kids' table. Yeah. Or... We don't really trust God's intentions towards us, and we don't really want to admit either one of those things. Yeah. Um, but it, if we don't trust God's intentions towards us and whatever He's saying, you know, then that's going to have ramifications in our in our lives. Yeah, people shrink back; they compromise out of fear, social pressure, fear of being ridiculed or labeled or canceled or fired. Uh, I know you love my analogies, and uh, <laughs> I got I got a good one for you. Uh, I say this all the time. I've said it for a long time. If you're a Christ follower, you're playing an away game. Yeah. We're playing an away game. And, and this past season, the Cats in football, we played Georgia in Athens. Yeah. We played South Carolina in yeah. Columbia, those yeah. terrible yeah, that's rooster crows. rooster all night long, yeah. And UofL, dirty UofL in, yeah. in Louisville. And in basketball, we've played Florida already in Gainesville, and we're going to yeah. play Auburn in Auburn. We're going to play Tennessee in that god-awful orange facility. Yeah, that's right. We got um, beat by A&M the other day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So away games are harder games. The yeah. crowds are ruthless. The the focus is antagonistic. The effect of the crowd on the away team, it doesn't matter whether it's at the free throw line or just trying to get the ball down the court. The referees can can be impacted by the crowd. Very visible in games. There's a lot more pressure. Even though the courts and the fields are the same size, the ball is the same yeah. size. The goal is still 10 foot, but the environment is way different from playing a game at Kroger Field or Rupp or an SEC tournament in Atlanta. So talk about how the church and how we as godly men find ourselves playing an away game and why we have to be aware and diligent and courageous and intentional with our lives and our, our yeah. worldview. Yeah, I mean, the knowledge of your surroundings is really, really important. You know, I think I've talked about this quote before, and it's funny because I'm not a big Lord of the Rings fan at all, so I can't even tell you which movie, which book, or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, there's a there's a scene where one of the characters says to the other, he's trying to challenge him to fight, basically. Like, we've got to go to war, and, yeah. and one of the characters says... I don't want to risk open war. And the other says back to him, open open war is upon you, whether you would risk it or not. Yeah, like, bro, yeah. you don't get to choose anymore. The yeah. fight's here. Yeah. And so it's important to understand your context and your surroundings. And I think, like, continuing with your metaphor, in away games, there are a couple different kinds of players. There are 
the mm-hmm. players who are uh, they thrive in it. Like yeah. they love it. It fuels them, and they get yeah. really antagonistic, and they they go after the crowd. You know, you think of I'll date myself and you here, but you think of like Reggie Miller and Madison yeah. Square Garden with Spike Lee. <laughs> you know, he's gonna drop buckets on you, turn and cuss you out and, yep. you know, make Keep all kinds face. of gestures. Yeah. Um, or it can make people shrink back and play worse and get paralyzed and right. it's overwhelming. I think as Christians, again, continuing with the metaphors, we don't want to be unnecessarily provoked yeah. and we don't want to perceive it as like, man, I just need to come out guns blazing, throwing, Sh- throwing, throwing yeah, 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 exactly. Absolutely. And being, because some people can take this mandate of like, all right, well, if, if Jesus says I'm going to be hated, then let me go try to provoke people to hate me. Yeah. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what we're if saying. You'll just, if you'll just follow Jesus, <laughs> it's coming. live like Jesus, it's coming. <laughs> like you don't have to go provoke it. Right. And we want to be, we want to be, you know, kind of like the Black Room Podcast. Talk, we want to be known for talking about the right things in the right ways. If right. we're going to be hated, let's be hated yeah. for the right things in the right ways, not because we were big jerks. For, for the right reasons. Right, for the right yeah. reasons, not for yeah. being big jerks. And we've seen enough people in the modern evangelical world like take this as like a mandate, like, oh, yeah. okay, go be a big jerk to everybody. So we don't need to do that. No. Also, though, we don't need to shrink back. Yeah. So there's some things that I think we need to – make promises to ourselves on. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Somebody asked me, yeah. you know, if I'm in a situation where my, what I believe and why I believe it comes up, I'm not going to, I'm not going to back down. I'm going to kindly yeah. um, tell the truth, yeah. you know, things like that. And so I think we should expect to see conflict pop up in interesting places. Certainly if you're involved in the public school system, you're going to be running into all kinds of areas of conflict College. all the time. College, yeah. universities, yeah. your workplace, depending upon what values they've embraced, yeah. um, what strategies they're employing, what kind of leader you're having to follow, yeah. you may end up being put in positions where you feel like you have to compromise in what you believe and what you say and what you can what you can do. And so it's going to be important to navigate those with confidence yep. that it's okay if you end up in the crossfire. Yeah. Um, and that may, that may happen. Yeah. You said open wars upon us. Mm-hmm. And you talked about four big areas of conflict for Jesus and for us. And these areas that are pressing in on all four sides mm-hmm. are number one, religious legalist. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, religious progressives. Number three, false religions. Mm-hmm. And number four, corrupt governments. Mm-hmm. It feels like Indiana Jones is in this in this room, and all four walls, walls are just are, in. are just sliding in tightly, yeah. you know. And so, let's talk about the first one: religious legalists. Yeah. yeah. Uh, explain or define religious legalism. There's people that are brand new, or they're trying to yeah. learn learn these terms, or new believer, or they're in high school. What what is what is a religious legalist? What does that look like? Yeah. The way I like to phrase it lately is weaponized self righteousness. So there's. There's yeah. people who um, are very self righteous, and we all can wrestle with that in different ways. Sure. But it's a it's a different thing when you take your self righteousness, your pride, which self righteousness is basically my assumption that my religious performance earns me something with the Father. Yeah. So I went to church today. Now I score a couple heaven points. I read my Bible. That scores yeah. me a couple heaven points. I prayed. That scores me a couple more. Right on down the list thinks that we're earning something yeah. that we are get we are given favor by God because yeah, of grace yeah, through yeah. Jesus. It's not, not works based. Not be, it's not works based. Yeah. It's not because we did such a good job. Now that's that's self righteousness, thinking that I can merit my acceptance before the Father based on my performance or yeah. my behavior. When I weaponize it, what I do is I I leverage my performance in comparison to someone else's. Yeah. So I gotta find somebody yeah. To compare to, so the the parable that I used in that sermon that I've used before is the 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 tax collector, yeah, and, and the Pharisee. And so yeah. the Pharisee stands and he he prays, thank God I'm not like all these robbers, evil doers, or even like this tax collector over here. But I fast and I pray and I do all this cool stuff. You're welcome, God. Yeah, you're welcome. Aren't you glad you have me on <laughs> on your team? And meanwhile, you've got this tax collector who won't even he he he's, he's he won't head. even raise his head. He beats his breast. Have, Lord, have mercy on me, a yeah. sinner. And Jesus says it. 
this man walked away justified, declared righteous is what it means before God, not the Pharisee, because he threw himself on the mercy of the court, so to speak. So so what happens in in a culture, and especially in the Bible Belt, and and we're in it, um, is that there can be all these little intramural like dust-ups between Christians, and churches will lob grenades at one another. It'll happen individually as well, and it will be um, based on... Uh, one group or one individual's th- self-righteous thoughts about themselves, but in order to bolster those, they have to point at somebody yep. who's doing worse than them. And so, a lot of times, as as Christians, you'll have you'll have other Christians pointing the finger at you, saying you're not a true Christian because you don't X, fill in the blank X, Y, and yep. Z. And typically, what those things will be will be things that the Bible has not <laughs> talked about or certainly not prohibited. Correct. You know, so. You'll have you'll have another Christian go. Well, I don't understand how you could be a Christian and watch an R-rated movie, and you might bring up the fact that the Passion of the Christ was rated R, and it's it's confusing. <laughs> the gospel you know? is rated R, <laughs> right? Or the Bible may, is rated right. R, right? They, yeah. they may say something like, "I can't believe you would drink or you would smoke or you know whatever those yeah. things are." And you could talk about addictions and you could talk about drunkenness, but, sure. you talk, but what you can't talk about is that it's a mandate for all believers everywhere for all time to to not participate in those things. And so yeah. religious legalists have to find those things, not only to bolster their own opinion of themselves, um, but to feel like uh, they're getting ahead in what they perceive to be as a race. And it's yeah. not a race because we've been adopted um, yeah. into the kingdom. So that's, that's that that's that may play itself out differently in different places. I dealt with different, a far different level of religious legalism in Colorado than what I see here. Now, fortunately, at Southland, I really don't see religious legalists pop up very it's, often. It's pretty around cool. Here. It's, it's, pretty, it's cool. pretty unique. Yeah, it's it's weird because I don't know if you thought this, but when I went, when I moved to Seattle, I thought there'll be none of that. Yeah, and it's there. It is there. It it's is there. It's, you find it. Yeah, it, you'll find it quickly. You talk mm-hmm. about grace. Mm-hmm. You challenge people mm-hmm. in certain ways. They're going to come at you with their set of this is this is my new creed, yep. and because you don't follow it or you don't adhere to it or you're not willing to stand up to the, these three things, yep. then all of a sudden we're inferior, mm-hmm. and it's just not true. That's right. You know, that's right. This this legalist stuff is graceless. It's unkind. Yep. It's void of the love of God found in the life of Jesus. I, I appreciate the fact that you said, "Hey, if you hate it, Jesus hated legalism yep. more." Yeah. And I, I think that's so important because I think it it's so hard because I think there's I, I can't remember who it was but somebody I remember one time preached a sermon was saying if if Jesus came back to to earth he would not only tell people that God loves him but the second thing he would say is hey I didn't say that <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah absolutely stop it's saying like, that I never said that yeah right? and it's like gosh we and and some of some of the heat that we get from the world is because of that yeah and that makes it hard because people yeah. will just paint the whole wall the same color and it's mm-hmm. like we're no 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 we're we're not we don't we're not, that's not a hill that we die on because Jesus didn't tell us to die on that hill. Yeah, his harshest words were were for the religious legalists of his day and I think one of the reasons was not only because they were ever present pointing their finger at him yeah. uh, but also because I think he he really felt like man if anyone needs to be provoked it's them. Yeah. You know, if anyone kind of needs needs some hard truth, it's mm-hmm. them. And so, you know, when he's at parties at tax collectors' houses, yeah. they're standing outside going, how dare you? They, f- they just followed him everywhere. Yeah. And, and so if you're looking for this, just find it. It's it's everywhere. Yeah. And his response, you know, is, is hey, I, I came for the sick. It's not the well who need a doctor. Now, I think the tragic thing in that is that the Pharisees listening to him went, well, they, we're not sick. They think we're well. They think they're well. Yeah. You know, sort of like. They're sicker. Yeah. It's the older brother in the story in, in Luke 15. Exactly. You know, it's like we, we, we see so much grace, and then the older brother has so much vitriol and, and justice. You never mm-hmm. threw a party for me, blah, 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 blah. You know, look what he did. He, he dumps out even more of the, older brother's, the younger brother's story, yeah. and the dad's still gracious and good. Well, yeah, it's funny because I'm preparing for a, a sermon out of town this weekend, and I'm going to walk through a little bit of the prodigal son at the end of that sermon, and... I really think the older brother was every bit as big of a rebel as the younger brother. Absolutely. He, he stayed home, but he his heart was far months. from the father. Yes, you know? yes. Both needed rescue. Mm-hmm. Second area is religious progressives. Yeah. And uh, s- some of this is not new, obviously, but because of the ever-changing wind of culture, we've seen a giant uptick in religious progressivism. Mm-hmm. And so 
take some time and unpack what that means and maybe some examples of what that meant in Jesus' yeah. day. Because you talked about the Sadducees yeah. and some of that. So Yeah, the Sadducees were an interesting point of comparison because, you know, they ran the temple at the time and so they were reaping the benefits of being in power and um, people couldn't, you know, get to the temple to to worship without their, you know, kind of green light yeah. and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the biggest the biggest beef Jesus had with them was like, man, you guys don't even believe the scriptures. Like you, you guys, you yeah. guys don't believe in in life after death. So really, all of this, all all of Judaism for you is just a functional way to 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 live through your life that has some utility for you. But it's really not ultimate truth, right? So that creates all kinds of opportunity to really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you do, yeah. you know. Right. And so I think it's a pretty easy comparison to what we see going on with what I called religious progressives of our day. And at the at the end of the day, you know, we start talking about uh, the word deconstruction and things like that. Oftentimes, one of the first stops people make on their way towards a total deconstruction of their faith is either into a uh, religiously progressive worldview combined with oftentimes a religiously religiously progressive church and typically um, the first the first place we go with that has some sort of impact sexually yeah and I've, I've joked about this before but I really I really believe it like the first step in in deconstruction or the one of the very first steps that tends to happen is you'll see somebody who starts questioning um, Orthodox beliefs or historically just traditional beliefs that Christians have held for a long, long time because they're what we see in the Bible, they'll start to question, did God really, like, did he really mean, mean that, that whole thing about one man and one woman in yeah. the context of marriage? Did Jesus really mean when he went back and talked about what God intended from the beginning yeah. was for one man and one woman to stay together? And he gave very few exceptions for that. Yeah. You know, did he really mean, and the thing that, that bothers me the most about that there's a lot of things, but one of them is the whole phrasing of like, did God, like, yeah. did he really mean? That sounds yeah. familiar to me. It yeah. sounds a lot like what yeah. Satan said in the garden. It's did God, Did God really say? Yeah. And so what we use as cover, we use the word conversation as a cover. We're just having a conversation. We're just having a dialogue. Sure. We're just asking questions. And in the religiously progressive movement, everything begins with questioning really big, really significant things that... If those fall, a lot of dominoes fall. Yeah, the authority of scripture. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you and you you just start when you start cutting pieces out of the Bible, yes. you'll you'll just never stop yeah. cutting. You're, and it doesn't ma even matter what part it is that you you start with. And and we as believers, we don't get to do that. That's right. I, I did a sermon years and years ago called "A Highlighter and a Pair of Scissors." Mm. And I, I had a highlighter in one hand, a pair of scissors in the other. And the reality is what we that's the way most of us approach the Bible. And certain things we highlight, there's other things we either would love to cut out, but we don't have the courage to do it, right. but we just conveniently ignore. Right. And you know, Jesus comes along and he makes clear, hey, none of this none of this Old Testament stuff is going away. Yeah. I'm fulfilling Correct. significant portions of it. So none of it has failed. It was yeah. all pointing to me. So so Jesus didn't let go of the Old Testament. Jesus was a continuance of what was promised in the Old Testament to what the old te and to fulfill it ultimately. Yeah. And so none of us as followers of him have the liberty to do what he didn't do. Right. So if Jesus didn't take a pair of scissors to the Old Testament, then we can't either. And we certainly shouldn't do it with his words or the New Testament. So the highlighter needs to come out for everything. Yeah. So you'll see this in certain religiously progressive movements where they'll say, well, we just want to follow the words of Jesus. This was kind of popular about 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. We're red letter Christians. Yeah. Well, the problem with that idea is all the, the guy who spoke those red letters yeah. spoke, first of all, quoted a lot of black letters. Yeah. And secondly, did not, did not separate or delineate between what he was saying as being somehow above mm -hmm. and beyond. It was all the authority of scripture because it all came from God. So I think oftentimes we take liberties with things that Jesus Jesus certainly didn't take liberty right. with, and the and part of the problem is is because we're we're just as, we're ashamed to say yeah that's what Jesus said that's what he believed and so that's what I say and that's what I believe right 
Or I just don't want to do it. Yeah, I just don't want to do it. I just want to justify my own lifestyle and call myself a Christian. And that's what we'll see so often. Somebody deconstructs their faith. They say, I'm no longer a Christian or I'm I'm questioning and all that kind of thing. The next thing you'll see is they've divorced somebody or they're sleeping with somebody or whatever that may be. Because at the end of the day, it's like, man, I just want to do what I want to do and I need some justification for it. Yeah, listen, if you want to doubt or you, you, or you, you you have doubts... Then the reality is when you throw out the the truth source or mm-hmm. authority, mm-hmm. then it just opens you up to everything else. Yeah. And, you know, hey, use your brain and ask good questions, but you have to go back to truth to see what it is that it says. And and whether you like it or not, whether it's easy or not, whether it's understandable at times or, yeah. or extremely difficult, this is the this is the wagon we've we've hitched our our, mm-hmm. our horse to or mm-hmm. the horse we've hitched our wagon yeah. to. You know that's the reality. And so, I, I noticed, and I said this to you yesterday, but I noticed you use the words religion, religious progressivism instead of progressive Christianity, mm-hmm. which is the the fad, the popular phrase. Yeah. My, do you mind unpacking that? Yeah, I mean, I think it it's at a certain point it ceases to be Christian, and also the yeah. word religious religious is an important one to use because when I typically when I use the word religious, what I mean is a a system where you're earning something, yeah. and so on the legalism side, while the beliefs may be more orthodox, yeah, it's still the same thing of thinking I'm earning credit with the Father uh, because of my good behavior based yeah. on what I see prescribed in the Bible. Now on the religiously progressive side, it, it's not really about earning points with the Father. It's actually about earning points with culture. Yeah. So it becomes like, That's okay, good. so what can I do and say and assert to in order to get a seat at the cool kids' table? So if I need to say, um, yeah, I don't, I don't I don't believe in traditional um, marriage anymore. That's out, yeah. that's outdated. Right. Um, I, I believe that uh, marriage, marriage can be between a man and a man or whoever or whenever. Yeah. Um, it's that's virtue signaling. So you're trying to say like, hey, look at me. I'm one of you. I'm one of the cool kids. Yeah. I believe what you believe. Yeah. But what's striking to me about that is um, why would you want to earn points with someone who who doesn't follow Jesus? Yeah. Like what? It, what is the benefit there outside of just some sort of cultural equity that we shouldn't right. be trying to acquire anyway? Right. So, you know, Christopher Hitchens was my favorite um, – atheist, uh, big, big name atheist back in the day when the new atheist movement was big. And, uh, I watched an interview and re- I think I actually read the interview, um, that a lady did with him one time. And basically her question was, Hey, I- I'm a Christian, but I'm not a Christian, like the kind that you talk about. Like, I don't, I don't believe in sin. I don't believe in, in mm. life after death. I don't right. believe in all this kind of stuff. And, and so she was expecting him to go, Oh, well, cool. You're like an enlightened Christian, right. like, maybe we can have further dialogue. And what he actually did was he goes, well, you're just not a Christian. <laughs> he's he's yeah. an atheist. He doesn't have a dog in the fight. Yeah. He's going, that's, no, I no. mean, you're either on the team or you're not. He recognizes He could see it. it. Yeah. Yeah. He Absolutely. could see it. And he had a much greater appreciation for people that he perceived to be the real yeah. McCoy, not yeah. people who were trying to pander to him. Correct. Correct. Progressive Christianity isn't Christianity. It's another gospel, yeah. and it's not the gospel. Right. And when we dilute or alter or change it, it ceases to be what God intended it to be. Yeah. And so, you know, as you're as you're talking about this earlier, it's like I'm, I'm in my mind. I'm going back to Revelation. The end of the book. It says, if anyone adds to, or takes away from, yeah. there's a lot that's coming on on the yeah. backside of that. And yeah, so, we talk about hypocrisy a lot on the legalist side of things, but we don't talk about it enough on the progressive side of things because really, what you're doing is you're just you're just painting a facade, calling it Christian, but beneath the surface, there's nothing remotely Christian yes. about it. Yes. The progressive side of this when it comes to religious progressivism is the Bible's a human book. It can be altered and changed. It downplays the fallenness of man. It's soft on sin, sinful behavior. It's obviously, you mentioned this, soft on sexual ethic, same-sex relationships, gender. There's an avoidance mm-hmm. of, of God's hatred of sin. Mm-hmm. God is gracious, but he's really not just. Yeah, Not a concern. Don't worry about it. You won't have to worry about standing before him one day. And that's just not true. God's truth is cons- is constantly being changed or edited or adapted that it fits into our lifestyle. And that's not the way that this operates. Right. Jesus goes, "No, no, I am the way." Yeah. And so if you're if you're going to if you're going to take me, then you're going to take my way. Mm-hmm. And we don't go, "No, no, no, I'm going I'm going this way." And Jesus, you're going with me. That's that's not how this works. That is not lordship. Mm-hmm. It's not at all. And so I, I I found this passage as I was thinking about this you know, as I was preparing, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. 
And there's, there, it, there's two distinct things that, as, as I see this, the first four, four verses and, and then five through seven. But I'll just read it, and then you mm-hmm. can comment after. But, but Paul is talking to Timothy, and he's telling them about what's to come. And he says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power, having nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women, and I would say gullible men, Mm -hmm. who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so he's telling about this culture that exists in their day and certainly exists in our day. And so anything from the first four, the last three verses that just... Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of Romans 1 and some other places you'll see Paul do similar things where he just goes down this long laundry list of like, it devolves into chaos. You're going to see all this stuff happen. I think everybody for the last 2,000 years has read that, highlighted that, circled that and thought what he was talking about today. And they're all right. Yeah, right, right. (laughs) They were right in Ephesus when he wrote it to Timothy. He was going, yeah, that's today. Like the day's coming, but it's also like right now. And I think we get hung up on thinking, well, when's that day coming? Right. It feels like it's right now. Well, yeah, we're in the last days. We are. Yeah. We, I promise. Jesus said it was true. Um, and then I think the the other piece to that, yeah. you know, Paul talks about this with Tim, people will try to gather teachers, yeah. you know, to tell them what their itching ears want to hear, yeah. you know, and... I'll find there's people that, no, that want to tell me things that I like, things that, right. the, the ways that I want to live... And I go, man, that's my teacher. That's right. And there's no shortage of the, there was no shortage then, but man, there's certainly no shortage now. No. I mean, the, in the age of the inf- information age and the internet and Books, all that kind podcasts, of thing, podcasts, blogs, and you can just those guys don't even have to go to a, someone's home to infiltrate yeah. it; they're already in it. Yeah. You know, so it's just far more acutely present today than than it was back then. And I think the context of like. Man, just always dialoguing, talking, conversing, but never actually arriving at a place of firm belief. Yeah. Like, this is what I believe. These are yeah. the hills I'm willing to die on. And denying the power of the gospel, that's what you'll see in these progressive circles. It's just dialogue. We're just talking. Yeah. You, it's like nailing jello to a wall. Like, you yeah. can't get anybody to commit to any firm foundation because yeah. the whole thing depends on there not being a firm foundation. Yeah, that's good. That's good. In this podcast, you've got all kinds of different listeners. You've got Mm -hmm. high school students and college students and young adults. you got new believers. you got dads with kids, young kids, middle school and high school kids. What wisdom would you share with them? How can we guard ourselves against this religious progressivism that's prevalent in our culture? Yeah, I would say if if you're prone to people-pleasing, pay close attention to this because if you're prone to people-pleasing, this is going to be even more tempting for you. Um, So if you if you're one of those folks who you have a high concern for what other people think about you, this is going to be something you really have to keep high on your radar. Yep. If you're the type of person who likes to avoid conflict, yep. be careful. Yep. Um, if you're the type of person who really worries about other people's feelings, yep. be careful. Yep. Um, now, on the flip side, <laughs> if you like love conflict, you love a good fight, and you sure. um, don't give a rat's you know about other people's feelings, and right. you, you're going to have to be careful, but in a different way, yeah. similarly to what we've already talked about. Like, don't just go slinging you know yeah. flames everywhere. Um, model your your tone and your behavior after Jesus's. Don't get out ahead of him, and don't get behind him. Just stay right there with him. And I think for both camps, if we'll go, okay. Jesus really challenges me if I'm a people pleaser towards courage. Yeah. Jesus really challenges me towards moving toward a problem, moving toward conflict, yeah. loving people with hard truth. Yeah. That's hard for me and challenging for me, but because I'm trying to follow after Jesus and his Holy Spirit's shaping me and conforming me into his image, I'm going to join him in that endeavor and becoming more like him. Yeah. Now, he moves us toward conviction and purity. He moves us toward yes. doing the next right thing. He moves us mm-hmm. away from and mm-hmm. toward certain things. And if if we find ourselves being moved away from the the right things, that's yeah. a problem. That's right. 
And on the flip side, you know, if my struggle is, man, I struggle with kindness, you know, I need to adjust my tone. I need to make sure compassion and love and mercy and grace are all a part of what I'm communicating to a lost and broken world. Not like I'm really excited that the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Right. You know, some people you would right. think, man, they just love it that people yeah. are headed towards hell. It's Why would you love day. that? Jesus yeah. didn't. You know, so yeah. so I think on both sides we have to again, if we're keeping Jesus in clear focus, if you're a husband and a father, a student, wherever you may be, that's yeah. the that's the thing you're gonna have to pay attention to is yeah. who what your personality is, the strengths and weaknesses, and how Jesus speaks into those and challenges those. Yeah. And you know, we 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 get books brought to us all the time or podcasts and things like that. Just because something says Christian. Yeah, it doesn't mean it is. Doesn't mean it is. Mm-hmm. And so you got to be careful. And as you're, as you're reading or listening to something, you have to go back to the worldview that God's, a biblical worldview that God's giving us in mm-hmm. his word. And if you don't have that, then you've got to get in God's word. You That's have right. to know his truth. Because right. if you don't, then you'll just be moved by That's lies right. and deceit. You'll be moved away from truth. And so pay very close attention as to who you put but as your teachers, because mm-hmm. if they're just telling you what your itching ears want to hear, it's going to put you in harm's way That's right. and all that you care about. So uh, it, it, this this thing about progressive Christianity, again, it's it, we, hate the t- we hate that phrase because it doesn't feel very Christian at all, but Alicia Childers has a podcast, mm. and she tackles this a number of times. Yeah. I, I looked, and it's like six or seven times. She came and spoke at our women's conference. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, and maybe you've got kids, you're trying to figure out how to navigate some of that stuff, or you're a new believer, then you can check that out. But she does a really, really good job uh, talking about this stuff. You parked on this point when you spoke about these two words, grace and truth. Mm -hmm. And I know grace and truth is three words, but we're just going to highlight the two. But you said in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made us dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And the word became flesh and and the creator entered his creation. Uh, he wasn't only fully human. He was fully divine. Colossians says he's the image of the invisible God. John says he came from the Father, and he came full of grace and truth. And it's not grace or truth. Mm-hmm. It's 100% grace and 100% truth. And you spoke about how that put Jesus right in the middle of religious legalists and right in the middle of religious progressives. Mm-hmm. And so you said for the religious legalists, Jesus was too soft on sin. Mm-hmm. For the religious progressives, Jesus was too harsh on sin. Mm-hmm. And and the reality is Jesus demonstrated full of grace and full of truth over and over again in every interaction in the gospel, in every conversation, in every exchange with the religious and the irreligious, the, with the disciples, the rich and the poor, the possessed and the powerful. He did all of those things. I mean, the cross is a picture of full of grace and full of truth. Mm. He loved us. He died for us. And also there's truth. That truth was somebody had to die for our sin. And Jesus took on, he became our substitutionary atonement for us. The empty tomb is is a declaration of grace and truth, that sin wasn't just defeated, that that, that, that grace and truth took care of all of that, and we can now live unafraid of death and unafraid of anything in this in this life because because he is truly who he says he is. Mm-hmm. It's very important for us as, as Christ followers. You even said this corporately and also personally. And so expand on what that means for us as we try to follow our leader and live in that. Here's the biggest part. It's living in that tension. Yeah. How do we live in that tension rightly? Because we're going to get shot from both sides. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, I think of the interaction with the woman who was caught in the act of adultery as a perfect example. Yeah. Because one team, let's say the religious progressives, they love that story yeah. right up until the moment Jesus looks at her and says, where are those that condemn you? And she says, they're not, they're not here. Well, then neither do I condemn you. They're like, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. And that's where they yeah. want to stop the story. <laughs> and but then, then Jesus says, go and sin no more. Yeah. And that that's deeply offensive. Yeah. Wait a second, Jesus. Yeah. Are you saying what she was doing was yeah. sin? How do you know why she ended up in that? You know, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. No, Jesus <laughs> Jesus says what she was doing was sinful. And he says, yeah. don't do that anymore. Yeah. Don't do that. Anymore. I love you. Yeah, love it you. It matters. And because I love you, don't do that Don't anymore. make your life worse by right. attacking on more yeah. of this stuff. Yeah. Trust me. Come toward me. Yeah, the other, me. the other team, the religious legalists, the one who somehow captured her, drug her into the right. temple courts, and, and then stood there with stones ready to literally kill her at yeah. Jesus' command, 
you know, when Jesus says, those of you who are without sin, throw the, throw the first stone. And yeah. it's, it's always interesting to me that it's the oldest to the youngest. Yeah. The oldest are just like, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're like, I, yeah, I got a long laundry list. I, I got nothing to yeah, say against that. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and so yeah. the religious legalists are disappointed that the, that the lady didn't get stoned. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. Like, Dadgummit, why did Jesus do that? So, and you can, when you see that grid, you know, grace and truth, it, You'll see it everywhere in Jesus's interactions. Yeah, you'll you'll see it in his interaction with the Samaritan woman at, at the well. You yeah. know, religious progressives are fine right up until that moment that he goes, "Hey, why don't you go get your husband?" Yeah, and she says, "Well, I don't, I don't have a husband." Yeah, <laughs> and he goes, "Yeah, that's true. Truth bomb. You've had five, and the yeah. one that you're living with now is not even your husband." Yeah. and all of a sudden, the religious progressives go, "Well, how dare you, Jesus?" Yeah. You yeah. know. The religious legalists, on the other hand, are going, why are you even talking to a Samaritan woman? Yeah. Don't you know the rules? You can't do this. <laughs> You're, not You're supposed in public. To do that. She's a Samaritan. And by the She's way, a woman. we don't want her or her people yeah. to get saved. They're not on our team. They're not on our team. Yeah. You know, it's like the New Testament yeah. equivalent to Jonah, who's like, God, I'm not going there because I know you. You'll yeah. save those people. Yeah. If I preach to them to repent... They'll do it. They might do it, and yeah. then you'll welcome them in. And I don't like them. And He's I don't miserable. Be, yeah, they're miserable. Yeah. And if we get down that road, we get miserable too. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we we have to follow Jesus to the middle of the field, mm -hmm. but know that that puts us in the middle of the battle. And you said this, and I, I'm I'm really glad that you said this in your message. We don't do we don't do grace and truth perfectly. No, it's impossible for us to do perfectly. <laughs> but we have to really fight as men of God who, who live in that tension. And here's the deal. You said this. You won't be like, and at times you'll be hated. You're going to take shots. You'll be accused of being too soft mm -hmm. or too harsh. Mm -hmm. There's a high probability you'll be made fun of, labeled in a number of ways, narrow-minded, judgmental, fundamentalist, old-fashioned, intolerant, bigoted, racist, homophobic, <laughs> transphobic, et cetera, et cetera. Those opposed to Christ, Christ followers who, st who stand, those opposed to Christ followers who stand with Jesus, there will there will be words and labels fashioned to attack those who are meant to harm and wound and silence and margin. All they're trying to do is get you to quiet, be quiet, yeah, yeah. just to stop. Mm -hmm. And and so here's the deal. you got to put your cup on. you got to realize mm -hmm. that our world is a battlefield, and some of the arrows will come from people in the world who have no association with Jesus, and some of those arrows will come from friendly fire, people mm -hmm. inside the church. And Jesus talked about this in, in Matthew 5, 10 through 12. He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is re your reward in heaven, for in the same way they have persecuted the prophets who were before you. Mm -hmm. He's just telling us, hey, man, it's happened, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen again. And, if, and here's the deal. In this... When you stand for me, there's going to be great pleasure, and I'm going to be glorified because of what you're doing. Because what we're doing is not, we're not trying to be right. Mm -hmm. We're trying to bring hope to people. And mm -hmm. and the, the fact is we can't just bring grace. The truth is what tells us our need for grace. Yeah. I think we're so accustomed to people pandering to us that it gets really off-putting when Jesus doesn't pander to anybody. Yeah. You know, because Jesus wasn't running for office. Right. He was declaring that he was king yeah. over everyone and everything always for all time. And yeah. so that's why even when like people were wanting to like, oh, let's let's coronate him king king yeah. of Israel, he's yeah. like, That's too small a throne, yeah. man. <laughs> he's like, You don't understand. I didn't come for this race. I didn't come for that one. Yeah. And so but we're used to and this may lead into where we're going here in a little yeah. bit, but you know, we're used to politicians pandering to us, yeah. like trying to get our vote. And Jesus Flip -flop is, and waffling, Jesus whatever is not saying, interested. whatever we can. He's yeah. not interested in going, so will you vote for me? Yeah. yeah. He's not doing <laughs> That's that. That's right. That's right. So false religions. Mm -hmm. um, you told two stories. We just talked about the woman at the well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He offers her living water, grace. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then eventually he says, hey, go tell your husband. And mm -hmm. that's when that whole truth bomb comes in. You have no husband. Yep. You've got five. You've had five, and the man you're living with is not your husband. He gives her grace and truth, mm -hmm. and she tries to change the subject yeah. on anything. Let's talk about where we should worship, <laughs> yeah. what mountain, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 eventually, she's talking about the Messiah, and he just says, he pulls back the curtain, and says, "Hey, you're looking at him, yep. you know." And then the second story is about you know Jesus healing this tortured mm -hmm. demoniac in Matthew five, yep. and 
he's you know I think you mentioned this and you may you may say it better but he was a product of his culture yeah. you know um, yeah. and Jesus has ultimate authority he stands his ground he looks him in the face and he tells the demons to leave mm. and they leave they don't yeah. argue they don't go hey well hold on hold yeah. on they they know who he is right. and they don't argue they yeah. they obey yeah. and and when Jesus entered the the, the world in, in human flesh he entered a world full of gods Yes. Baskin's Robbins doesn't have enough flavors behind the counter for all the different gods and false religions mm-hmm. that were there in their day and there in our day. In the first century, many were polytheistic. They had a God for everything. Mm-hmm. And the reason that Jesus came was to clarify that there's only one God and one way and one hope. Mm-hmm. And now in a world full of coexist bumper stickers and yes. flooded with all kinds of world religions, and you just live your truth, man. Mm-hmm. As long as you're sincere, as long as you're a good person, all roads lead up the same mountain of God. It doesn't matter what church, what God, what path, what book. Jesus came to destroy all those false narratives. And you said in your message about false religion, Jesus doesn't allow any room in the human heart for anyone or mm. anything else. He takes the whole thing mm. over. Yeah. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And I, I, just dig out that point for a second, because yeah. why is this so important for us as men and believers? Yeah, we really, we've really we come to believe, at least in practice, if not in our actual, we, we may even say it that way, like we've come to believe that like Jesus came for our thoughts and our feelings, but we can keep all that kind of private. Right. He didn't really come to transform or change anything we actually do. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you may you you may assent to the right beliefs, but it doesn't really matter if that shows up in yeah. you know, your, your life, your marriage, your parenting, your the way you work, you know, everything. Right. So we compartmentalize things and go, okay, Jesus, you get these two little boxes um, called like church and my private you know, interactions yeah. with you and my prayer life and things like that. But when it comes to how I interact with the office, like you get no say. Yeah. When it comes to how I treat my You're wife, in a you box. get no say. When yeah. it comes to what I do in front of a computer, absolutely no say. When yeah. it, You know, you can go right on down the list. Yeah. And, and Jesus never made that promise. Yeah. You know, I mean, when he is asked what's the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That is as all-encompassing a statement as you can possibly make, you know. So everything you think, everything you feel, everything you do, all of it comes under the authority of Jesus. Um, And so I think it's just He doesn't fit in a box. He doesn't fit in any box. No. Yeah, yeah. So as men, we just, number one, we need to recognize that and recognize men. Part of this journey with him is fully surrendering the territory that already belongs to him and not fighting against him. Yep. but joining with him and walking in step with the Spirit. He wants good for us, and he knows right. what's best for us. One one thing I want to mention before we leave this point, and we'll get to the last one, but we did a staff meeting October 21st, 2021, and it was a long time ago. You're going, okay. Yeah. Uh, but we, 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 we were reading this book called Post-Christian by yeah. Jean Edward Veith. Veith. Yeah. And it's a very heady book. Mm-hmm. A lot of staff weren't happy with you. <laughs> Still mad at um, me. Yep. But it talks about our culture and the war that is – on you know for us as Christians, yeah. and you, you you gave a talk to our staff, and you made a comment, and it I I usually write down a lot of notes, and I, I I've searched this, and I thought I'll I'll find it, and boom, it came right up. But it, you said this: the great challenge today is not to convince people that there's a God. Yeah. The great challenge is to convince people that there's only one God. Mm. And we'll say that again: the great challenge today is not to convince people that there's a God. The great challenge is to convince people that there's only one God. Mm -hmm. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, I think we're seeing as a reaction, this will get a little bit technical, but as a reaction to modernity, which called into question God. So the rise of atheism, evolution, all that kind of stuff called into question the supernatural and the idea that there's even a God. Well, that ha- that experiment has failed. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we're actually stepping into a postmodern time frame, which is actually far more like um, pagan times where, man, you had people who believed in, like you said earlier, gods for everything. You know, so if you go, there's certain places you can go in Lexington, you know, yeah. but Pearl Street and Boulder, where Allie and I, you know, used to live, if you <laughs> yeah. walk down it, I mean, you will see every possible yeah. religion that you can imagine. I yeah. remember doing a man on the street thing there one time and a, a girl talking about how she was Wiccan and um, she worshiped flowers and trees. And, you know, yeah. so people worship literally anything and everything. So it's it's a lot more akin to like when Paul was in Athens. Yeah. He's Marcel. walking around in Mars Hill and, and he says to the Areopagus there, he says, man, you guys are super religious. Yeah. 
That's so, got so, it all. Yeah, and that that's more what we're in now. Like yeah. we're super religious. People believe in all kinds of stuff, crystals yeah. and you yeah. know, combination of all kinds of different things. Yeah. Part of that is symptom of the internet and information and gurus and people like that out there. But what he what he says to them is like, hey, I, I even noticed you guys had a an altar with an inscription to the unknown God. Yeah, it's like they were trying to cover all their bases. Yeah. Like I'm sure this, we've missed one somewhere, <laughs> so let's just have this generic unknown God. So don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to get in trouble with him. Yeah. And what what Paul does is he leverages that to go. I want to talk about him. Yeah. Because y'all don't know a thing about him. And guess what? He's the God. he's the one who created everything. He's yeah. the one God. Yeah. There are no other gods. Yeah. So I think we're challenged That's with good. a very, a very similar challenge yeah. in our day and age. It's not like there's not as the the new atheism movement was kind of like the last gasp of modernity trying to de- demand that everybody conform to the idea that there is no God, there is no yeah. supernatural, and the human heart doesn't have a lot of room for that. No. We, you can claim to be an atheist, but it's really hard to live as a consistent atheist, and yeah. so most people aren't. Yeah. But what they do is they fill that vacuum with a lot of different religions and a yeah. lot of different idols. Yeah. So then the challenge is even greater. You know, I think it was Martin Luther said the human heart is an idol factory. We just generate them, man. Mm. We'll worship anyone and That's anything. Good. We worship created things instead of the creator. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is draw people back to worship of the creator. Yeah. We got one more key point, but we'll move fast through it because I know you got to get out of here. A fourth area that that – that Jesus found himself in, in the uh, in the line of fire from was corrupt governments. Mm-hmm. And his ministry was right in the middle of the most powerful world yeah. empire in yeah. history, Rome. We think things are hard and contentious now in the U.S., and I'm not saying that they aren't, but it doesn't hold a candle to what was going mm-hmm. on in the first century. And you mm-hmm. said, in a system that a system that allowed for all kinds of religious expression, there was one thing that wasn't allowed. You could not and must not question the authority of Caesar or the, the Roman government. And, and Jesus was looked at as a threat from mm-hmm. the religious leaders, legalists, mm-hmm. the, the religious progressive, false religions, and now the superpower of Rome, corrupt mm-hmm. governments. And you, you walked us back and forth through this conversation that Jesus had with Pilate. Mm-hmm. And the reality is Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And maybe at first he, he just didn't want to be bothered, but something in him knew that he should stay out of the middle of this. He didn't mm-hmm. want to be bothered. He he tried to move Jesus back to Caiaphas, but that was only temporary. And the charges brought against Jesus were many, false accusations, lies about about Jesus. But one that, that stuck, stuck. Mm-hmm. was that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Mm-hmm. And this claim grabbed the attention of those people because Caesar and and. and Pilate's career and very life was in harm's way if he did not address this. Yeah. And that that is that Caesar described himself as his own title, the Son right. of God. Worship any God you want, heck, serve a dozen of them, but they've got to be lesser gods than Caesar. And mm-hmm. Jesus' claim was too great. And they go back and forth, and Pilate peppers Jesus with questions. He flexes his muscles and speaks about his power to put him to death. And yeah. Jesus comes right back and says, hey, you have no power if he weren't given to you. Pilate tries to free him, but the Jewish leaders played this ultimate trump card. Hey, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. You're no friend of Caesar. That's Anyone right. who claims to be king opposes Caesar. Mm-hmm. So you got to do something with that. So he's pushed back in the middle, right there in the middle of the field with Jesus, and he's he 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 has no option. And the cor- the roar of the crowds, shouting over again, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. These hours were filled with corruption and deception and injustice and false false accusation. And lies, and Pilate was flooded with with pride and fear, cowering to the pressure of the crowds, his own fear of Caesar. Even though he knew that this wasn't right, and his wife had even told him, "Hey, you better stay steer clear of this guy." But feeling like he had no no other option, he he releases Jesus to be crucified. And what God, what man meant for evil, God meant for good, and it was for our good. And Jesus was tortured, and he and he died on the cross, and he was buried. And three days later, death couldn't keep him in the grave. And as you mentioned, Matthew twenty eight eighteen, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me, which means when anyone resurrects from the grave, <laughs> they have all authority. Yeah. And then you said that means that there is no area of anyone's life anywhere that Jesus isn't willing to stay out of. There is no issue that Jesus doesn't have authority over. There's no cultural boundary that he's unwilling to cross. This means that Jesus is king over everyone. He is king over Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. He's king over Donald Trump. Joe Biden, he's king over the White House, the courthouse, the schoolhouse, the church house, and even more controversial than that, he's king over your house and my house. Bro, you went Tommy Lee Jones in the future. <laughs> Talk about the importance of that statement. Yeah. Um, there's so much 
that could be said. I, th- I think one of the, th- the things that we've come to idolize and worship in our culture that's so confusing for people, and this is the second I say the word, people are going to freak out, some people, is democracy. And so yeah. because of the temperature of our political environment, you know, everybody claims that the other team's threatening democracy, democracy, democracy. Right. And I would, it's funny because I don't know that most people could actually define what, what, what democracy, democracy is, is sure. or yeah. the fact that we're in a democratic republic and the distinctions between that. That's all another discussion for another day. Right. But what we do tend to think is, is if 51% of the people think one thing and 49% yeah. of the people think the other thing, whoever the 51% team right. is not only wins, but they're actually right. They're right, yeah. And that's not true. (laughs) So if 51% of the people said today, you know what? Um, It'd be totally fine if we were willing to kill children up until the, from pre-born till the age of two, you get to choose whether you want to keep that child or not. And so if you want to leave them out in the cold to die prior to that, especially if they have special needs, by the way, this has happened in many cultures, many times. Right. 51% 51% of the people thought that, believed that, and voted it in. That would not make it right, right. and it wouldn't make it true. Just because it's a popular majority, yeah. it doesn't mean that it's truthful. And so right. one of the great conflicts of my ministry has been when people have come to me, either in writing or in person or whatever, and said, man, you're getting real political. And what I always respond with is, I didn't get anything. Yeah. Again, I've been standing here as yeah. best I can with Jesus articulating what he's articulated, yeah. revealing what the scriptures reveal plainly. Yeah. And if something that's revealed in the scriptures or something Jesus spoke into becomes a political issue, I don't have the luxury of being able to leave it alone. Yeah. And so because we've been conditioned into this framework of separation of church and state, and again, yeah. most people can't even... Everything's even come, political now. They can't even come close to telling you what that actually means, means and what right. it was intended to protect, which was to protect the church from the state, not the other way around. Yeah. We've come to think that preachers are just not allowed to talk about anything yeah. that is today political. Now, no. <clears throat> we've seen a lot of preachers do this wrong. I need to acknowledge sure. that. Like, sure. When a preacher uses his platform to campaign for for someone that's wrong right. you know because you're actually submitting to to a structure that you are actually the church the church is is over and above that right so people have done this poorly they've done it incorrectly but the right reaction is not to entirely withdraw from anything and everything that might be remotely considered political because guess what that circle's so small yeah We'd be left to talk about what exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Stay in your lane. It would be a little bitty lane that you can't even get a car in. At at this point in our culture, I can't even think of an example of what it'd be okay to talk about. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. In the old days, like it'd been like, hey, could just don't talk about abortion. Don't talk about homosexuality. You know, don't talk. Now it's literally like anything and everything I say, people go, well, you're just being political. Well, if you see everything through a political lens, I can't fix that for you. But I still have to talk about these things. Absolutely. You you made a very important statement. Jesus defines what love looks like and what love is. Jesus loves us enough to leave us to not leave us to our own devices and allow us to walk down deadly paths. He loves us enough to call out our sin and not only point us in in a better direction, but to be the way for us. Mm -hmm. That's crucial. And I think we we want to... There's something in us that wants to resist that in the world. And it's like, man, he just wants good for us. Mm -hmm. And he he knows what's right and true. He was the creator, sustainer of life, and we can trust him. And, And yeah... It ain't always going to be popular, and it and, and it's going to it's going to put us in harm's way, which is really important. You close and you pointed people toward the gospel and to to repent, and come home. You close with reminding us we will be accused of showing too much grace to sinful people, Southland or us. We will mm-hmm. be accused of delivering too much truth to sinful people. Mm-hmm. We'll be we will be accused of being too exclusive by by false religions, and we will be accused of being too expansive by corrupt governments. But it's okay. Yeah, it's going to be okay. And there's a couple of verses, and then I'll wrap up. First Peter four fourteen through sixteen. It says, "If you're insulted because you hear, because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder or stealing or making trouble or prying into other people's affairs. Yeah. But it is of no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name." 
And then, and then Paul gives us some good insight here, Philippians 1, 27 through 30. says, but whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come, see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I know that you will stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For his It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, this is so big, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for him, Mm -hmm. since you're going through the same struggle you saw that I have and now hear that I still have. He's in prison. He's in chains. And he's he's saying, hey, listen, Jesus told you, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Stay. But how how you suffer is important, and how you conduct yourself is super important. So anything else in that? Yeah, I mean, I wrap up by just saying we seem to be so concerned about making sure that we're found on the right side of history. Yeah. As if history, this thing called history, were yeah. some sort of judge and arbiter of what's right and wrong and true. Yeah. And it's a it's a ploy, it's a device, you know, that harkens back to you know, Christians who were pro slavery, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. And yeah. so it's a it's a useful trump card to play them. Don't you want to be on the right side of history? You don't want to be like those people. Yeah. Well, no, I want to be on the right side of Jesus. Yeah. The people who abolished slavery yeah. did so specifically because they were followers of Jesus. Yeah, right. It was Jesus that led to the abolition of slavery both in both in Europe and and here. And so I don't really care. Yeah. At all about what people a hundred years from now. Yeah. First of all, how narcissistic, narcissistic yeah, to think right. they're going to be thinking about Scott Nickel a hundred years <laughs> yeah. from now? Well, he was on the wrong side of history. Yeah, they're right. not going to be thinking about any of us. Yeah. Name your no. great great grandfather. Yeah. You, you can't. Okay, so right. I'm far more concerned about being on the right side of Jesus, sheltered by His righteousness, following after Him, and letting the chips fall where where they may. And yeah. so I think every man we need to reconcile with that and be okay with that. Yeah. This was a phenomenal message. It was on January 7th. If you didn't get to hear it, How to Be Hated and Three Easy step, Simple Steps, you can go online and check it out. If you if you heard it and you went, man, I, I caught some of it. You need to hear it again. I'd encourage you to listen to it. There's also a graphic that you used in service that uh, we, we'll put up on the video so that way they can see it. It'll be in the show notes so that way you can pull it up. I think it just, will, it, it just helps us kind of see – where Jesus is found in the middle of those crosshairs yeah. with those four areas and where we where we find ourselves yeah. in this process too. And so I'll, I'll wrap up. You, 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 mentioned, uh, you mentioned Reggie Miller talking about our age. I'll, this wasn't in our notes yesterday, but I thought about this. 20 years ago, 23 years ago, the San Francisco 49ers were playing the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. During that game, 49ers wide receiver Terrell Owens – Went and scored a touchdown, and then to rub it oh, in yeah. Dallas's face, yeah. he sprinted to the logo yeah. in the middle of the field, yeah. and he lifted his arms. The crowd resounded with boos yeah. and jeers and vitriol. Later, <sighs> Terrell Owens scored a second touchdown, and what and did he do? Emmett Smith. He baby. went right back to the to the middle of the, of the field, and he got to the star. And this time, it was different. Uh, and and I, it was Emmett Smith. I, I, I saw Emmett Smith. I saw George Teague, who was free safety. I thought came, it was Emmett. Came but, full yeah. speed, launching Terrell Owens like a missile, and yeah. knocked him down. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because Terrell Owens was playing in a way game. Yeah. You, you stand. You stand on a disrespect. The. the the, the home team you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're, you're gonna, gonna be viewed fire. as a threat and so Nico your sermon clarifies for us where we find ourselves if we're gonna follow obey live for and stand for Jesus it puts us in the middle of the field standing in the enemy's territory where we're gonna take shots and the beautiful and power, powering thing that we got to remember is that we're not standing in the middle of the field alone Jesus stands with us and he'll Give us what we need to stay standing. If we get knocked down, he'll give us the power to get back up and live for him. And and just to wrap up, big discussion today as we think about the ethos of men. And I want to close with this question. The question is, is what has God been saying to you? Um, we covered a lot of ground, talked about a lot of different things. But what's the Holy Spirit been saying to you? And, and where is he prompting you and speaking to you? And if you're not a Christ follower... Our prayer today is that you would consider the claims of Jesus, investigate them for yourself, and take the most important step in your life and accept his invitation to follow him and let him be your king and your savior. But if you are a Christ follower, our prayer, men, is that God would drive you to a deeper commitment to follow Jesus, to lock arms with him and us and enter the battlefield and move to the middle of the field in this away game that we find ourselves in where Jesus is embodying grace and truth, declaring who he is, 
and who we are because of him and standing for and fighting with and fighting for the most important things and and trying to be a voice in a very dark place so that we can reach the people that maybe even are antagonistic toward the things that we actually believe. Why? Because he's worth it and because people matter to God. Any final words, ma'am? All right. Thanks for jumping on. Great stuff. Excited to see how God's going to use this episode. Appreciate you, ma'am. Uh, thanks for thanks for killing that that sermon and and uh, I'm grateful for the the truth that we that we're going to discover and keep trying to live out. If this podcast has encouraged you, I'd love to hear from you. If you're wrestling with Christianity, would love to talk to you more about what it means to be a Christ follower or figuring out what your next step is. Uh, shoot us an email at lockroom at southland church. And as always, if this podcast has encouraged you, you share it with your friend. Um, Let's get after it. Let's fight for the most important things. Let's catch you next time on Locker Room.